Sentiment is down as the big chip makers fall. 30 minutes until the start of trading. I'm Matt Miller. I'm Shanali Bassett. And I'm Katie Greifeld. Bloomberg Open Interest starts right now. Tough trade talk weighs on sentiment. The Biden administration considers using the most severe trading curbs yet on China. And on the earnings front, Johnson & Johnson cut its full year forecast to account for a spate of recent acquisitions. We'll speak with the CFO of J&J &J in the next hour. And a Bloomberg Business Week exclusive. Donald Trump talks taxes, tariffs, Taiwan and more. Let's take a look at where markets are trading right now. 30 minutes until those bells ring. And as Shanali mentioned, a lot of geopolitical concerns hitting the chip makers this morning. That is dragging down futures on the S&P 500 down 1%, even more so if you take a look at the Nasdaq 100 off by 1.5%. And the bond market, not a haven bid here, Matt. 10-year Treasury yields up about three basis points. All right, take a look at the great rotation that we saw yesterday. This shows the Russell 2000's outperformance over the NASDAQ 100 going back to 1999. You can see a big pop there after the dot-com bubble burst. Um, but here is the biggest jump of the Russell over the NASDAQ since then. So that's reversed a little bit today, and I think we're going to focus again, Shanali, on the big cap stocks. The reason we have to, of course, is what we've been talking about with that Biden stance. NVIDIA lower alongside other chip makers after the Biden administration said it's considering those severe trade restrictions yet on China's chips uh, and across the sector. You're seeing NVIDIA now down pre-market about 4.1%. Watch, Matt, the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index today, right? The Sox. Yeah, we'll be watching the Sox for sure. Uh, that trade news really seeming to put a damper on what was um, the 38th record high that we saw for the S&P 500 yesterday. And it really speaks to the risk of concentration when you have such enormous companies that have so much sway over, of course, the broader indexes. This is what happens. You get that group hit specifically, those semiconductors, and then you're looking at a 1% decline. All still in the middle of earnings season, we should say, too. We yes. have a ton of names reporting before market, after market. We'll talk all about them today, won't we? Yeah, absolutely. Especially Johnson & Johnson. We're going to speak of the CFO a little bit later. We're also going to talk about the turnaround in JCPenney, or the turnaround attempt there, which I am very much looking forward to with the CEO. Here you can see uh, futures right now, S&P futures down more than 1%, NASDAQ futures off one5 Aaron Brown joins us, PIMCO Portfolio Manager for Multi-Asset Strategies. And Aaron, it's a very different story today than um, we saw yesterday, celebrating yet another record high on the S&P. Does this rally, not what we're watching today, but over the longer term, does, does the rally that we've seen um, marching up, up, up this year have legs? You know, I think it does have legs. It's really being underpinned largely by a increase in the EPS earnings projections. And, you know, I think what we're likely to see this quarter is that the second quarter is going to be the first when we go through earnings seasons that we're actually going to see a broadening out of positive earnings from the uh, S&P 493 stocks. To date, what we've seen is it's really been tech-led. Tech has been driving not only performance in the market, but also the increase in earnings estimates. And we're finally going to see, at least on a year-on-year -year growth perspective, positive earnings out of the rest of the S&P 500. So I do think that this broadening out of participation in the market is likely to persist as we move through the end of this year. What we're seeing right now in markets is that populism in politics is translating into populism in equity markets. And so I do think that there's more uh, legs to go for this rally. I want to focus on that term you used, broadening out, because we've been calling it a rotation trade. You've seen that uh, make its way through the sell side notes. But are you viewing this as a broadening out or are you viewing this as a rotation where you're seeing some of these smaller names, what you're seeing in the earnings picture as well, come at the expense of big tech, for example? So for sure, right now you're seeing as a rotation trade out of big tech and into the larger S&P 493 stocks. But as we go through the rest of earnings season, what you're going to continue to see is leadership in terms of earnings from the tech sector. And so I do think that that's going to be a point where people you know, reconsider some of the sales that they've made and move back into more of an equally weighted index throughout the rest of this year. 
Aaron, even if you do like AI, even if you do think this rally has room to run, you're seeing the market react to geopolitical uncertainty here in reaction to the whole U.S.-China dynamic that's been playing out through the Biden administration, but certainly set to play out if Trump were to win the election in November as well. How do you think about the uncertainty around these AI names, given the ties they have to semiconductors, chips, and China? So there's certainly a risk to semiconductors, but you have to think about the Trump administration and the potential policies on, on two hands. On one hand, you may see t tougher export restrictions. You know, a lot of that is already understood and priced into the market because even under a Biden administration, you're likely to see tougher export restrictions on the chip makers. And that's been a theme and a narrative that's really played out over the last 18 months or so. On the second hand, you potentially could see lower corporate taxes or at least corporate taxes not going up. That you know, the first time around definitely helped this tech sector and should be supportive for the tech sector going forward as well. So, you know, I think that you really have to think about all the policy implications under a Trump administration. Right now, tech is very owned. It's what people have to sell. So if they're looking to, you know, sort of decrease their exposure in the market, they're likely going to be taking it out of tech. And that's what you're seeing play out right now. But the earnings are going to continue to be supportive, you know, even absent or even, you know, in light of tougher export restrictions, there's still too much demand right now to meet the available supply, and that's going to continue to be very supportive for the AI sector in particular. You know, very few multi-asset funds have outperformed just, you know, buying the S&P and holding it over the last 5, 10, 15 years. PIMCO is, I think, one of the only ones that, that has. Is it difficult to convince customers to diversify as, you know, just holding one index outperforms every time? Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's really been a one game market, which has been owning the S&P 500 or owning equities. So the idea of broadening out, starting to diversify into bonds, into credit, into, you know, alternative assets apart from, you know, pure equities has certainly been, you know, difficult. But we're really at a pivotal point right now for the markets where the Fed is about to start cutting rates. We expect that they'll likely cut two times this year and continue through a quarterly pace of cutting throughout much of next year. And in that market environment, now is the time to actually start to diversify your portfolio, to move some of that equity into bonds, create more diversification, broader risk factors that you're able to really source returns from. And I think that's really what's going to be key to outperforming over the months and quarters ahead. Well, Aaron, when you say more money into bonds, let's be specific here. I mean, where in the bond market are you thinking treasuries? Are you thinking credit? And are you more comfortable with credit or duration risk right now? It's a great question. And so what we've seen to date really over the last couple of years is that investors have really been hoarding cash. And that makes a lot of sense when the Fed is, is hiking rates or even when the Fed's on pause. But the point at which you want to start moving out the duration curve into longer duration assets like Treasury bonds as opposed to cash is the exact point when the Fed starts to cut rates. And we're really coming very close to that point right now. So I think it makes sense to First, move some of your, you know, out of your risk out of cash into bonds. And then secondarily, you really don't have to go that far out the risk curve into, you know, credit, particularly long duration credit, given that 10 year yields or, you know, the core bond fund is yielding close to 5% right now. And so you don't have to take much credit risk. You really just need to take a little bit more duration risk. So I think belly of the curve, intermediate uh, uh, you know, point of the curve with respect to duration gives you a really good return with not much risk. And so that's really where I'd be sizing my bets right now. Aaron, we thank you so very much for joining us. That is, of course, Aaron Brown of PIMCO. Now, I want to also take a look at some stocks moving pre-market today. A lot of news out there today. We want to take a look at Eli Lilly, now down more than 3.3%. This is off of more competition. In that market for weight loss pills, Roche was jumping, of course, on the early stage data that showed more competition. Also looking at discovery. And, pi and pills, by the way, oral medication, I think, is the key to this. Because mm -hmm. there are people who want to lose weight with drugs and don't want to inject themselves but once a week. But that's been the white right? whale so far. I mean, trying to get that medicine into pill form. I mean, it's more complex than just making a pill. So Roche, uh, this pill in their trial, patients took it once a day for four weeks and lost 7% of their starting weight.
Very impressive. Yeah. Now, also, um, but well, I'm more excited about the financials real quick as well because you see Dis Discover jumping once again. The reason this is important, guys, you're already looking at Discover at a record high. They agreed this morning to sell a private student loan portfolio for up to $10.8 billion. KKR is involved, Carlisle's involved. And remember, they're in the middle of that big deal with um, Capital One as well. Discover reporting after market, Synchrony Financial reporting before market, and you are seeing Synchrony down meeting but really just missing a little bit on net interest income deposits below estimates we're still in the middle of the financials reporting guys yeah absolutely um well hopefully getting near the end of the financials reporting <laughs> slowly. No, slowly 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 getting <laughs> to the end you're relishing every last second of it uh Shanali's universe there coming up former president trump sat down with bloomberg business week for an exclusive interview we'll bring you the highlights of that conversation next as the rnc rolls on in milwaukee this is bloomberg Now to high interest, to look at what's making headlines around the world. A Fed rate cut may be warranted in the coming months, though not at the central bank's meeting in two weeks. If recent inflation, the slowdown that we've seen continues, that's what New York Fed President John Williams suggested in a Wall Street Journal interview. The remarks indicate a September move may be on the table, but Williams isn't down to clown in July. Kathy Wood is making a bold call on Tesla. The ARK Invest CEO says the company's move into the autonomous taxi business will be a catalyst for a roughly tenfold increase in its share price. Wood has been bullish on Tesla for a long time, making it a top holding in her ARK Innovation ETF. The shares are up 3% this year, while Wood's Innovation Fund has lost nearly 9% year to date. And the mayor of Paris has stuck to her word, taking a dip in the Seine to prove it's safe for swimmers ahead of the Olympics. France earmarked around one and a half billion dollars to clean up the river amid concerns that overflows from the city's sewage system make it unswimmable. The Olympic triathlon events swimming leg will take place in the Seine as well as the marathon swim. French President Emmanuel Macron has also committed to a swim in the river at some point. Katie? All right, now to the RNC, where old rivals of former President Donald Trump come together to praise him and push for a message of unity within the party. Donald Trump has my strong endorsement, period. When President Trump was in the White House, Americans had more money and lower prices. Our borders were secure and our laws were enforced. Iran was broke. The Taliban stopped killing Americans, and Putin didn't invade anyone. We now head to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, home of the RNC, joined now by Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern. So you heard it there, Anne-Marie, that message of unity being preached. We hear from J.D. Vance tonight. We've heard a little bit from him in interviews already, but are we expecting him to continue that message? Well, he's really going to come on the stage today, and we've seen a bit of him taking to the floor, sitting next to Donald Trump, listening to those individuals last night. Really, the standout was, of course, Nikki Haley, who was a foe and now is really coming on to the Trump camp, trying to bring her followers and saying she supports him and endorses him 100 percent. I think for J.D. Vance, it's going to be about, one, this is the first time we'll see him as the VP pick. It's the first time that this RNC will hear from him. And part of it's going to be an introduction of who he is. He's going to talk about his upbringing in Appalachia. He has a memoir out about this. You know, he was raised by his grandparents, who were blue dog card carrying union Democrats. And he's going to talk about how that Democratic Party doesn't exist anymore and how Trump's policies make sense for America, especially Americans that feel left behind and Americans that feel like inflation has just eclipsed their paycheck. And I think really part of this pick for the former President Donald Trump and going with J.D. Vance, given the fact that he's someone that, in a lot of sense, mimics a lot of what Trump has to say about policies is he can speak to those individuals in swing states, notably Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. This Rust Belt, these are the states that Biden has to win to maintain his presence in the White House. And this is where Donald Trump is really going to try to make inroads. So we're going to hear about who J.D. Vance is 
at this moment in time, right, Emery? Because he's been a very different person in the past. He was a never Trumper <laughs> who suggested that uh, Trump may be America's Hitler. He was an atheist who is now a Catholic. Um, he embraced gay rights and now has passed uh, or at least supported anti-LGBT um, uh, 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 legislation. So why these changes? What, what pushed him to do a 180 on so many issues? Absolutely. This is the J.D. Vance of 2024. He basically said that he got to know these policies. He thinks they are better for America and also got to know Donald Trump. He's a very, very close friend of Donald Trump's son, Don Jr., as well, who is a real advocate for his pick. But you're certainly right. These comments are going to be juxtaposed on what he said in the past. Can you imagine in 2016 when Trump won for the White House the first time, ran for the first time, J.D. Vance was a, a contributor on CNN bashing him. And you've read some of the comments we've heard, some, some of what he had to think about him that was in private text that have leaked out, calling him America's Hitler. He now absolutely praises the man. And you fast forward from 2016, bashing him live on TV when he won the presidency to 2024, sitting next to him and being his VP pick is quite a U-turn. Um, he's talked about this a lot, and he's willing to talk about it again. I'm sure potentially he'll shed some light on that as well, because a lot of people want to hear that part of the story, because they do remember the J.D. Vance that was, quote, a never-Trumper. This is also an individual who um, really has a lot of different paths that led him here. He was a venture capitalist, and he served in the Marines. At the same time, also, he was he's a senator. And he's actually only been a senator for a year. So he's got a lot of different um, places that he's worked in and, and been a part of that he's probably going to try to shed light on today and what he thinks why all those, those different experiences can help him be a great VP for Donald Trump. But obviously, the microscope is going to be on him. All right, Anne Marie, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Anne Marie Hordan there in Milwaukee. Stay with Bloomberg Television and Radio for more special coverage on the ground at the Republican National Convention. Watch all week starting at noon Eastern on Bloomberg Television. Now, Bloomberg Business Week had the opportunity to sit down with former President Trump in Mar a Lago for an exclusive interview. For more on that, Brad Stone, the editor of Business Week, joins us now from San Francisco. And Brad, you know, the interesting thing is. I think about J.D. Vance is that it seems that he wants to turn the Republican Party around to a party that really represents the working class, that is the party of those blue dog Democrats um, that he experienced in his childhood. Did Trump uh, say anything about the way he wants to lead the party to you guys in this interview? Yeah, thanks, Matt. You know, we went down there just for a little context at the end of June. So two days before the, the first debate with President Biden, almost two weeks before the assassination attempt. And we went down with a very explicit mission to talk to him about Trumponomics and his agenda for business and the economy and the world order. So we asked him a few times, you know, in different ways, what is Trumponomics? And he talked about lower interest rates, lower taxes, less regulation, less immigration, uh, but really t attacking in inflation and, and to the extent that that does appeal to uh, blue collar workers, blue states, that is part of his agenda. Now, the way he does that is pretty unorthodox and a lot of mainstream economists think it's not going to work because, of course, when you do increase tariffs, you run the risk that companies turn around and pass it on to consumers in the form of higher prices. Same with Restricting immigration, you really run the risk in a tight labor market of uh, raising wages and then raising prices. You know, Brad, one really interesting part of this interview, too, was the push-pull that he had with corporate America. And when you're watching this populist sentiment really overtake many parts of the Republican Party as well, how does Trump thread the needle on certain stances, particularly big tech? You know, Trump is, you know, he, I don't know that threading the needle is his skill. He he wants to be liked. I mean, it, it came across to, to me going down to Mar-a-Lago, just in the, you know, you put him in front of a camera and he rails against the media. You have him play host at his home and he, you know, and he's personable and tries to be charming and, and wants to be liked. And I think that applies to business leaders as well. It was a few days after his speech to speech to the business roundtable. He was bristling at reports that the speech didn't go over well. He said that you know he would consider Jamie Dimon, uh, who he has called 
uh, an overrated globalist in the past as Treasury Secretary. Um, uh, Glenn Youngkin, he said he'd like to be part of his administration. And so I don't, you know, I think he's trying to court both parties and he really wants to be liked by business leaders. I showed him our former Business Week cover, Bernard Arnault, and he immediately wanted to know from me whether Arnault was a friend of his. Hmm. And so that kind of gives you a little bit of insight into his psychology. And uh, Brad, I do want to talk about geopolitics because you did ask Trump point blank, would you defend Taiwan against China? And his answer wasn't an unqualified yes. It certainly wasn't, Katie. I mean, I was listening to it thinking, are we, is he shipping China out in real, uh, Taiwan out in real time? You know, he talked about um, Taiwan stealing our chip business, the expense of, of defending the, uh, Taiwan, how close it was to China. He called it the apple of Xi's eye. And, you know, that's representative of the way that he really does think about some of our, of our historic alliances. He certainly uh, does not take them for granted. All right, Brad Stone, editor of Bloomberg Businessweek, thank you so much. You can read the entire interview in the August edition of Bloomberg Businessweek, that exclusive conversation with Donald Trump. And speaking of geopolitics, let's take a look at NVIDIA right now because shares are down by more than 4% pre-market, of course. You also have the Biden administration threatening tougher curbs in addition to Donald Trump's comments on Taiwan. Really a one-two punch for the chip makers. And of course, you can see that in NVIDIA shares. This is Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for Social Climbers. The company's making waves on social media this morning. First up, Deere pulling back from diversity measures as it faces conservative criticism. The ag machinery giant is under attack for allegedly funding a pride event and funding employee resource groups dedicated to LGBTQ people and people of color. Now, this pivot mirrors a similar move by Tractor Supply, which said last month that it would retire DEI targets. Next up, a sneaker war is brewing. Skechers is going toe-to-toe -to -toe with L.L. Bean, filing a lawsuit that alleges that the outdoor clothing retailer copied its patented shoe designs. The debate centers around Skechers' heel cup design that surrounds the back of the foot, and the lawsuit seeks unspecified damages and for L.L. Bean to stop sales of the shoes. And finally, five below, closer to rock bottom. The discount retailer announcing that its president and CEO is stepping down as sales creator. Now, the company also cut its outlook for the quarter, citing slower spending by lower income consumers and increasing theft. Now, you can follow all the latest company buzz on TREN Go on your Bloomberg terminal. Now, coming up, Matt Perrone, he is Janice Henderson, Global Head of Solutions, why he's expecting slower growth for the second half of the year. This is Bloomberg. Moments away from the start of trading, this is Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Matt Miller. We are looking at futures that are off by more than 1% across the major indexes. You can see uh, the S&P and the NASDAQ um, down the most. Tech stocks, the biggest ones, are dragging us. Here at the New York Stock Exchange, you can see Onity ringing the, uh, the starting bell over at the NASDAQ. We see uh, Shoulder Check, which is kind of like a hockey playing mental health organization. In terms of the major averages, um, we can expect to see a real reversal from yesterday's records. Let's get over to Katie Greifeld to see where the trade is landing. Yeah, Katie? Matt, it doesn't matter if you are big or you're small, you're down today. You take a look at the S&P 500, currently off by 1%. The NASDAQ 100 sort of flirting there. Now you can see we are solidly down 1.7% lower on the NASDAQ 100. And small caps, of course, we've been talking about the great rotation all week taking a bit of a breather right now russell 2000 down about nine tenths of a percent but one stock specifically to keep an eye on is johnson and johnson out with their second quarter results and while profit beat expectations the company did cut its full year forecast to account for a number of recent acquisitions and we'll get more on those results next hour when we speak to johnson and johnson cfo joe wolk 
Katie, I'm also keeping an eye on Synchrony Financial down almost 3% as the market opens. It reported that second quarter uh, had met the av average analyst estimate. But remember, you are still watching investors watch these financials closely. Net interest income kind of shy of expectations. Same with deposits. We'll see how the rest of the season goes. All right, and NVIDIA is down alongside other chip makers. We've been talking about this morning. The Biden administration said it's considering its most severe trade restic restrictions yet on China's chips access. Let's take a closer look at the chip makers with Abigail Doolittle. Abby? Well, Matt, we do certainly have stocks under pressure, and a lot of it does have to do with the chips, but also big tech. I would argue that there are three things going on. These are the four most valuable companies in the world. You can see that they're all down 1% or more. The chip stocks down the most for that very reason that you were just talking about, the Biden administration threatening greater... Uh, a crackdown on Chinese chips. But I would say that there's something else going on here because you have Apple and Microsoft uh, lower. Yes, clearly there could be a read through to the chip situation. But you also have what may be emerging as the Vance trade because uh, J.D. Vance has been very vocal in terms of saying that he supports some side, sort of crackdown on big tech. It started yesterday. It seems to be bleeding through today. And then third, well, we have a massive rally in the Nasdaq 100. If we go into the Bloomberg terminal, this index over the last five years or so, four years out of the pandemic lows, up, you can see at the pandemic lows, this is actually the uh, 2023 uptrend, but out of the pandemic lows, up more than 200%, going from 7,000 to above 20,000. That's really incredible. But over the last year or so, or six few months, I should say, not really hanging on to this trend. The RSI, the momentum is weakening, suggesting that we could see some sort of uh, healthy consolidation given that big rally. But there is is one big exception here, Katie. Let's take a quick look at Intel. The last time I saw these shares, they were up about 5%. Actually, now they're up about 7%. I was looking at the tape. I did not see an obvious reason. Maybe you all know, but they, of course, are planning on some sort of expansion here in the U.S. more. Uh, so perhaps that has a piece to do with it, or maybe there's something on the tape now. Yeah, maybe there's a pair trade going on there. Sell NVIDIA, buy Intel. We'll continue to keep an eye on that one. Our thanks to Abigail Doolittle. And joining us now is Matt Perrone. He is Janice Henderson, Global Head of Solutions. And let's start, of course, with big tech, particularly what we're seeing in the chip makers. And today is a nice reminder that when it comes to chips, it's really uh, bipartisan, sort of the focus on China right now. Of course, we have the Biden administration reportedly threatening tougher curbs. You have Donald Trump, of course, talking about Taiwan. And then you think about just how important some of these big names are when it comes to the makeup of the indexes. How vulnerable does that make this market? Hi, Katie. Good to be with you. Uh, yeah, I think there's, um, look, look, they've been very extended and they're ripe for a correction or a pullback um, and some consolidation, I think, as the term you used earlier. I think that makes sense. We are thinking that a broadening out of the market probably makes sense as well here. So there are a number of cross currents, a number of factors that could cause this rotation. We think eventually they'll find their footing. They'll grow into you know, valuations, which recently have expanded somewhat. So we're not worried about the fundamentals. Obviously, this is a good time to take some profits and rotate into other areas. I think that's sort of a, a short-term dynamic. Do you need rate cuts? I mean, we're uh, talking today about Waller and Barkin and monitoring everything any Fed uh, speaker says. Do you need them to cut in September? Do you need them to cut two or three times this year? Uh, need is a strong word, but that's I mean for the rotation, Matt. I mean for oh, this for this trade to work out that you know smaller caps can uh, finally rebound. Yeah, I think for the smaller caps, that's probably true. Um, you know, if if there was some backing away from rate cuts, that would be a problem for uh, smaller caps. I think that is the the big story driving the rotation, so to speak, especially into the smaller names. Um, that said, you know, as we said in our mid look mid year outlook a few weeks ago, we think this is a good time for careful risk taking and broadening out in equities. So we've added to mid caps, which you like a little bit better than small caps. We've added to non U S equities just because we do think that the moderating growth, the, the rate cuts will allow a more broadening uh, of the market. So this is kind of consistent with our view uh, that we will be seeing more participation from different parts of the market. 
I also want to bring in some headlines here. Federal Reserve Governor Christopher Waller saying the economy is getting closer to a point where the Fed can reduce borrowing costs, but he'd like to see more evidence that inflation is on a sustained downward path. When you think about the thinking coming out of the Fed, Matt, how much uncertainty is there around not anymore the timing of rate cuts, but the number of them? Yeah, I think that'll be the next question the market has. How how many cuts are we going to get? What's the pace and the path of, of policy rates? I think that's going to be, you know, kicked around quite a bit in the market and will cause some volatility in the market. And we're sort of expecting that. And we've been in melt-up mode for some time now. And I think we'll alternate between, you know, inflation not coming down fast enough. Uh, then we'll have growth scares, which will cause volatility. So, you know, buckle up a little bit. We think it'll be bumpy. But still, the, we like the backdrop for risk in general, just given the fact that now we're officially on the rate cutting path. And it'll be, we don't know the trajectory exactly, but it, we're in a new regime in that regard. A lot to look forward to there, of course, when it comes to growth scares and some of the bumps that uh, you just laid out there. But, of course, we're talking about rate cuts as we're really heading into the heart of earnings season. I know, I mean, when you think shorter term, the next couple months, what do you see as the real driver? Is it going to be that rate cutting story or are we going to be talking about corporate fundamentals here? Well, I hope we're talking about corporate fundamentals. <laughs> we think the story there will be pretty positive, right? We have, we've had strong earnings growth out of the tech cohort. That's been the dominant story. Um, when you look forward, that there's a catch up happening in earnings that we see but that'll close the gap. And again, that's positive for the market backdrop. So we're excited about that, um, that, that possibility that we'll see more uh, participation more broadly from, from the markets due to the fundamentals. But of course, that we're also coming into election season. So it's gonna be interesting. How, how important is election season? I mean, so much talk about, um, you know, J.D. Vance and, you know, the sort of unique Republican take um, that he has in terms of uh, fighting big tech. On the other hand, we, we did see Trump doing a lot of that when he was in office last as well. So is, does that matter to you, that kind of theme in terms of your investing? So, you know, we generally don't invest on politics, although we will we'll look at policies that are enacted and how they will impact us. So it's it's possible that some of these policies on both, regardless of administration, will have uh, distortions at the sector level. That's true. We don't see it broadly in the market as being a durable theme. Typically, you get some pressure, a lot of volatility into an election, and then typically there's a rally out on the other side, regard, regardless of a uh, party that wins. So we do think we'll get through. That's more of a short-term dynamic. Matt, we thank you for joining us. That is, of course, Matt Perone of Janice Henderson. Now coming up, regional banks on the biggest winning streak in four years. We're going to dive deeper into the sector next. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Open Interest. Quick check on the major indexes here. The S&P 500 down one full percent after hitting another record high yesterday. It's 38th high this year. Uh, the Nasdaq is down more, 1.8 percent, as we see, especially the big mega cap tech stocks falling. NVIDIA, for example, and other chip makers are off. And the Russell 2000 is down less um, than the big cap indexes. As we saw yesterday, a real rotation underway into small caps. And to some extent, that continues, I guess, lessening the blow on the Russell. Katie? All right, it's time now for Top Calls. Some of the analyst action in focus this morning. And first up, <clears throat> T.D. Cowan cutting Spirit Airlines to a sell. The firm says that it doesn't see the airline posting profit until the summer of 2026. And now that downgrade is coming as the discount airline warned of lower second quarter revenues. TV Gallon also cut American Airlines so hold as well. Next up, we have Bank of America raising its price target on Alphabet to $206, also keeping a buy rating on those shares. The analyst says that earnings for the tech giant will set a positive backdrop for the group thanks to its AI integrations. Remember, Alphabet reports second quarter results next week. And finally, Oppenheimer cutting its recommendation on Morgan Stanley to market perform. The analyst says that the bank's second quarter results were, quote, very solid, but the stock's rally has outstripped his price target, Shanali. 
And we're going to stick with financials because regional bank earnings are starting to come in. Citizens and U.S. Bank Corp out with results today. Regional and mid-sized banks as a group are up more than 12% recently thanks to growing optimism for those Fed rate cuts. We're going to break it all down with Herman Chan, the U.S. Regional Bank's analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. And it's interesting because you did see the KBW Bank Index rise the last three days. It's actually now outpacing the S&P 500. Pour one out for the banks, but you are seeing a lot of divergence. Mm -hmm. For example, First Horizons today coming out, uh, now really falling into the early trade. How do you think about where there might be some sore spots given the rally that we've seen? Yeah, that's right. So if you, you take a step back with large bank earnings uh, earlier in the week and last week, JP Morgan and Bank of America talked about a positive earnings trajectory and with respect to net interest income. PNC confirmed that yesterday, and we saw a little bit of that from U.S. Bank today. Uh, on the other hand, there, there's been some divergence, as you mentioned before, with First Horizon reducing their outlook for net interest income for the full year. So it's going to be some mixed trends with regional banks, it seems like. Do you have uh, any input from uh, politics, mm -hmm. when you look at your models, right, do right. you think about how um, a Trump Vance ticket mm -hmm. might affect the banks, even though you're not representing the, or, or studying the big banks, you're looking sure. at regionals? Yeah, so I, I, there, a lot of the enthusiasm for bank stocks also hinges on a potential Trump presidency. Uh, really, that's focused on lesser regulation on regional banks. Uh, there could be more tiered regulation that, that the prior Trump administration had with the Fed. And there could be more M&A activity. One of the things that's really hampering uh, higher deal activity within bank, uh, bank M&A is that the Biden administration has been pretty reticent on approving deals. So mm -hmm. in a potential Trump administration, you could see more, more tie-ups. That's what I've been wondering, because I remember coming out of March 2023, the mm -hmm. idea was that we'd see a lot more consolidation right. in the industry. We haven't really seen that regulation mm -hmm. being a big part of it. If some of those hurdles mm -hmm. would re were to be removed, I mean, right. how much M&A could we be talking about here? Yeah, we're still at pretty lows. Um, really, what's been hindering it is that there was one deal, the first rise in TG deal was was not approved by the by the Fed, and then there's there's been two factors, right? The Biden administration and also higher interest rates. So those two headwinds could actually go away in the next few quarters, and you could see some pickup in activity. Really, the industry is looking at the Discover Capital One deal. If that gets approved, then you could see some some more opening of. We do have rate. though still more than 4,700 banks right. in this country, right? I mean. Right. I mean, they could definitely merge. It's pretty fragmented compared to other countries. And, you know, to, to the point that he's making also, there is uh, been a lot of uncertainty around those deals. Mm -hmm. Maybe this lifts the cap. There's actually something else. When we think about rent, mm -hmm. actually, the Biden administration's potential rules around rent caps, right. I'm wondering how that might impact things. Because you saw a New York Community Bank take mm -hmm. a massive mm -hmm. hit based on this issue in New York. Could that be more widespread if this yeah, were to take effect? Yeah, that remains to be seen if it's really going to be fleshed out. It has, isn't really on the radar screen yet, um, but it, it has, as you mentioned, really affected what's happened with, with the properties, the multifamily properties that New York community is highly exposed to, and that's really one of the reasons why we had some hiccups with, with the, the stock earlier in the year. And I mean, just zooming out, you know better than most people that uh, the broader audience talks about regional banks much more mm. than they did uh, just a couple years ago. And a lot of that comes back to concerns of is there another shoe to drop, particularly right. when it comes to CRE. Mm -hmm. So just to really wrap this all together, is there another shoe to drop? Are we out of the woods? Right now, we've, we've had so many quarters of the banks understanding the potential risk of commercial real estate. Every quarter, quarter by quarter, the banks are adding to their reserves, specifically with office commercial real estate. And if Fed rate cuts actually do happen, that's positive for, for credit quality because your borrowers can, can support the, these potential problem properties a bit better with lower borrowing costs. Carmen, we thank you so much for joining us. Of course, at the middle of a very busy regional bank earnings season, start of all earnings seasons, though. Now, coming up, we're going to talk about the new CEOs appointed at HSBC and Warburg Pincus. We're going to discuss that and more in the Wall Street Beat. A lot of change at the top. This is Bloomberg.
We continue to invest along three dimensions. Technology, uh, uh, Jim and DeMar and the team run it, and they've done a great job. And so uh, five, seven years ago, we made a decision to give them more, more capabilities. Technology, the balance sheet that they can use to help their customers achieve their goals, and talent. And so Jimmy across the board continues to increase. And so we feel good about it. He made a billion four after tax this quarter, which, the, which is a very strong earnings quarter, but what's happening is you're seeing back-to-back -back billion dollar plus quarters. We're used to be a billion dollars plus and drop to 500 when the market slowed down. You're seeing much more stability. That was Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan speaking on Bloomberg yesterday. The bank has put more money and balance sheet resources behind its trading business. Remember over at Morgan Stanley as well, the CEO is saying we are back when it comes to equities trading. We're going to turn now to some other top finance stories in today's Wall Street Beat. First up, HSBC has named Georges El Hedri CEO to replace Noel Quinn, adhering to the practice of promoting insiders to turn the bank around, to run that bank. He takes a role less than two years, though, after his promotion to CFO. And next up, Nomura reshuffling its Asia investment banking team, cutting jobs, trying to reduce costs amid a deals Trump slump in China and Hong Kong. And I've got to say, that is something that people here are worried about as well if this continues in the United States. And finally, we're going to talk about Warburg Pincus naming Jeffrey Perlman CEO, succeeding Chip K, who will become chairman of Warburg Pincus alongside Tim Geithner. And Geithner? Yes, if you There's remember a blast that from he the worked past. there. <laughs> yeah. No, very cool. I mean, actually both, because Warburg Pincus, back when I started in this industry, was just a massive name mm. in finance. Uh, and obviously, Tim Geithner, throughout the great financial crisis, was someone we talked about literally every single day. Well, it's also interesting, too. You think about how long this company has been around, 58 years. This is just the third leadership transition in its history. So it really speaks to this is a company that has a lot of stability at the top. And obviously, this was not a decision that was made lightly. Yeah, and it's interesting. A fun, fun little fact, too. The former uh, comms chief at Goldman, now also working at Warburg Pincus as well. So there is a lot of uh, well-known heft entering those ranks. I've got to say, in the private equity universe, it has been tough to make transitions, but to your point here, just this, this is the third leadership transition. Not that many of them, but certainly new names rising to the top of Wall Street. So many changes at the top. Um, what do we know this far into reporting season? I know for regional banks, we're just starting, but we've got a lot of the big names uh, about um, the rank and file employees, about, you know, headcount in terms of contraction or growth. I'm glad you asked. Bank of America, for example, saying that without the temporary stats that they have this summer, headcount might have been flat to down. For example, at Goldman, it is flat. And we were talking about Nomura, for example. I've had messages from different investment bankers saying, you know, they wonder if there needs to be another round of job cuts because a lot of that deal boom has not come to fruition, at least in the way that people had wanted. Wanted. And you look at that story out from Deutsche Bank yesterday, this idea that they want rainmakers to focus not on the number of deals, not just many, many, many deals, but the more profitable ones. And so they're trying to make more money with less people. All right. I mean, good luck to them. I think that a lot of people in a lot of different industries are trying to figure that out as well, of course. As not we... to mention AI, right? Yeah. Because that could be a game changer, especially for like banks and law firms. Yeah, definitely. Let's take a look at these Katie's markets, though. Katie's eager to get some markets. <laughs> I really, I Katie's like, let's get to the markets. Yeah, I, I want to take day. a look, look at, at the, the socks. <laughs> the S&P 500 uh, currently off by about eight-tenths of a percent. I mean, we were coming off of a really rip-roaring rally, so I think, uh, of course, it is important. You think about some of the biggest names out there. NVIDIA, for example, uh, down quite significantly on geopolitical risk, and you can really see that expressed in the NASDAQ 100, off by almost 2%. Uh, and then you take a look at the small caps. Look at that. Those are your biggest winners, the little guys. Yeah, uh, the Russell 2000 actually up. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gaining as well. Just 30 stocks. Because, yes, but very big ones, right? right. So you see gains in uh, healthcare insurers. United um, uh, Health Group is up. Travelers is up. Johnson & Johnson is one of the biggest point additions on the wall, uh, on the Dow Jones Industrial. I rag on the, the Dow, but if you're looking for diversity within an index, you're going to find it. Can I add Dow one Jones. to the, uh, the alphabet soup? 
sleep, I want to look at the stocks to the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index now down uh, 25 out of the 30 stocks in it down on the day based on that worry about uh, the curbs on China as well. So we we're talking about NVIDIA, but the broader index also down, of course, after a 34 percent rally year to date. All right, let's get to the trading diary, what you need to be watching this week. Bloomberg continues special coverage on the ground in Milwaukee for the Republican National Convention. And we get oil inventories in about 30 minutes, so watch crude. This afternoon, we get the Fed's beige book data adding to um, the guessing game about when we're gonna get the first cut. Tomorrow, we get the European Central Bank decision, so if you're focused in on ECB rates, we'll give them to you. And on Friday, we'll get earnings from a number of companies, including American Express, and American Airlines. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to talk to Johnson & Johnson's CFO and give you the latest on J.C. Penney's turnaround with the CEO. We are 30 minutes into the trading day. Welcome to Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Matt Miller. I'm Shanali Bassett. And I'm Katie Greifeld. And tough trade talk weighs on sentiment. The Biden administration considers using the most severe trading curbs yet on China. On the earnings front, Johnson & Johnson cuts its full year forecast to account for a spate of recent acquisitions, but the stock is up. We'll speak with J&J's CFO. And JCPenney's billion dollar turnaround plan. CEO Mark Rosen tells us how he's transforming the 122 year old company. But first, let's get a check on these markets because the great rotation, it's intact, at least for this exact moment. You have the S&P 500 down about nine tenths of a percent. The NASDAQ 100, your big tech behemoths, down almost 2%. On the Nasdaq 100, meanwhile, the Russell 2000 managing to hold a gain for right now, currently up about half a percent, Matt. All right, so a big turnaround in markets. Let's talk to Ethan Devitt, the CIO of London CIV, which manages more than $18 billion in assets. Um, Ethan, do you think we're seeing a real rotation? Are people selling NVIDIA and buying small cap shares? And that's part of the reason that we're seeing a drop across the indexes? I wouldn't say it's a wholesale rotation, but it is definitely a rotation of one kind. That's just one of the dynamics in markets today. It actually is something that hasn't changed since the weekend's events in that we now we've been seeing this for some time a broadening. Many, many charts have highlighted the concentration in U.S. markets and a lot of attention has been drawn to that and concern has been raised that it's not sustainable. It's making life for active management extremely difficult. So I think all of that message has got through that there needs to be a broadening for this really rally and, and recovery to have real legs. We're seeing that both into small and mid cap, as well as out of the tech sector, which, of course, had all of the momentum behind it for so long. And of course, we're talking about size tiers here. This is where we've seen the uh, biggest movements that large into small. But when we think about this broadening out, I mean, are we seeing that enthusiasm to expand beyond just the sectors that have been leading the way? Are we seeing those underloved sectors actually play catch up here? To some degree, we're definitely seeing the banks, for example, up over 20% year to date. Their earnings are coming out right now. We're seeing a bit of a mixed picture, a bit of a mixed reception. But that certainly is a sea change from what we would have seen last year. Here. We've seen a little bit of interest in the industrials and um, healthcare as well. Nothing too dramatic. But what is now developing are another set of sector pros and cons, I suppose. And that's really based on some of the news flow over the weekend, some of the momentum around the election, the rise in crypto, and then the corresponding decline in, say, renewable energy stocks or anything that might be in some way tied to the ESG theme. You know, when you think about the trade ahead, we just got off another record high yesterday. You're seeing people take chips off the table off of geopolitical uncertainty today. Is there anywhere else, given the valuations we sit at today, that you would start taking more chips off the table, start taking some profits? I definitely would be a big believer in the just rebalancing at this time. We have seen, as he said, that's exactly what that is, the taking profits. But there's just been such a run up in the tech stocks. We're starting to move into the nuanced phase of the AI discussion. So we're beyond the let's just load up. It's an AI arms race and we don't really know the impact into, well, maybe the customers have more power. Maybe the second and third movers are starting to advance. And maybe there is an erosion of this leading market position. So that more nuanced 
renaissance phase is naturally going to lead to different fallout in the Magnificent Seven. And we've already seen that really a splitting apart of the Magnificent Seven year to date. So I think, yes, absolutely do take profit. But then the question remains, well, where, do, where do you divert that cash? There's already a lot of cash sitting in money market funds, record numbers, in fact. We have very low spreads on fixed income. So there's a huge amount of interest in that. So I'd suggest where people are diverting cash is where you see the action today in the smaller mid-cap stocks. we be hunting around for some unloved stocks there. Katie, look at yeah. this. If you type SPXL1, you can break the S&P into 11 industry groups. If wow. you look over the last five days, the biggest losers are communication services and infotech. There you go. The biggest winner is real estate. I mean, then you get energy, industrials, materials. Like what? A rotation it's been I mean that compared to the rest of the year Ethan that's the opposite of what we've seen um, are you exactly. dipping your toe into any of this trade we have always had core exposure so we actually have been in the, the camp of maintain the core it's a little bit of a, a boring story in that it doesn't tend to get excited by many of those sector momentums but because of that, this is exactly what we would have expected to see, a broadening. And it's really interesting what you mentioned about real estate. It does reflect the reversion to the mean, as well as perhaps the outlook looking brighter for real estate, for utilities, for all of those bond substitutes, as it seems that the next move on rates will be lower. So these bond substitutes have really struggled when there were risk-free alternatives, essentially, in the form of very high quality fixed income. So we're probably going to see that continued rotation there. Well, that's exactly where I wanted to go. And that's sort of the durability, the sustainability of what we're seeing. Uh, as I mean, we just highlighted, it has been breathtaking to just watch over the past five days. But uh, you think about some of the sort of uh, contrarians here saying that, OK, now we need earnings to actually back it up. So I'll pose that question to you. When you think about some of the uh, companies that are really shining right now, as we head into earnings season, can they back it up? Well, the interesting thing is that earnings have been very cleverly telegraphed and they're not, I think, really poised for perfection right now. So there is a little bit of headroom there for them to be but still surprised on the upside, but they've been managed very, very well. But say we are going to see a bit of mixed picture coming out of earnings. We can see that. We've seen the banks already highlighting them building in a bit more reserves in terms of consumer defaults, potentially, when it comes to credit cards, et cetera. So clearly there are these cracks appearing in the ever resilient U.S. consumer. And we've seen that a very mixed picture come out of some of the consumer stocks recently. We saw that from PepsiCo and we saw that from the airlines in the past that there has been just this variability of demand. So that's all going to come. It's all about the expectations. And I do not think they've been set too high this time around. So we're probably going to see these earnings surprise on the upside and um, and then let's see where the markets go from there. Even you think about how energy has performed in recent days. You think about how it's been performing the last couple of years, but certainly the trade has really favored it. Is this a rotation trade or is it a firm Trump trade? I'm going to go with the latter in this case. I think we all know the position on electric vehicles. We know that the attitude around some of the regulation is likely to change should there be a change of administration. And we, quite frankly, sustainable energy has seen headwinds now very much since COVID, when energy security became more important than sustainability and affordability was also important. We also had the geopolitical events that tended to interrupt that. So it's been a very tough trade. I'm sitting here in Europe where there has been very strong bipartisan momentum behind the sustainability trade and behind ESG norms. That is universally accepted within Europe, the European institutional base. It's a different situation in the US. So there has been quite a bit of dismay that some of these business cases have not played out and that some of the stocks have not worked out. And that's what I see as a continuation of that. It is a direct reflection both of a slightly increased oil price right now, as well as the what's on the horizon in terms of regulatory change. Ethan, great to get your take. Thanks so much for joining us. Ethan Devitt there of London CIV. Let's get to some of the stocks moving at this hour. For that, we go over to Abigail Doolittle. Abby? We would be remiss, Matt, if we didn't check in on the big tech trade because it is clearly to the downside. These are the worst four point drags on the NASDAQ 100 at this point. So two chip makers, NVIDIA and Broadcom, and clearly that has to do with the 
uh, Biden administration, as you've been talking about all morning, the possibility of tighter curbs, the worst yet ever on uh, China chips. But we also have Apple, Meta not shown here, uh, the other big tech names, Microsoft, Alphabet. And I would argue that some of that has to do with the Trump ticket and J.D. Vance's stance on big tech and a potential crackdown there. However, let's take a look at a bright spot for tech because in the last hour we were looking at Intel. It's not just Intel, it's also global foundries. Take a look at this, the best day since uh, 2022, up about 14%. They have one of their plants is in upstate in New York. One is in Vermont, and then they have a plant in Germany and Singapore. So they do not have that China tech exposure, chip exposure. Uh, you can see the stock soaring. And Intel, lots of plans for ex expansion in the U.S., up nearly 5%. And then finally, another bright spot, J&J. &J. Despite uh, cutting the outlook, we do have the shares up 3.3%, and they beat in the quarter that was. And Innovative Medicine, a big driver. Investors clearly liking it, Chanelle. Abigail, we thank you so very much for keeping an eye on it. Of course, uh, we do have a lot of movement under the surface. We'll bring it to you as it comes. But coming up, we will dig deeper into Johnson & Johnson's results with CFO Joe Woke next. This is Bloomberg. Well, shares of Johnson & Johnson are gaining this morning. The pharma giant's second quarter profit beating expectations on strong sales. The company also cutting its full year forecast to account for recent acquisitions. Here with more detail, I'm pleased to say we have Joe Wolk. He is CFO of Johnson & Johnson. And just starting with the numbers here, Joe, so you beat on adjusted EPS, you beat on second quarter profit, but again, it's that lowered full year forecast that's really uh, turning heads here. Of course, that can be chalked up to recent acquisitions, but if you could give us a little bit more insight uh, on that impact and beyond that would definitely be helpful. Certainly, Katie. It's a pleasure to be here with you and the team today. Um, we are very pleased with the second quarter performance. You know, we had 7%, better than 7% growth uh, across the enterprise, almost 9% in our pharmaceutical unit. MedTech, we were hoping for a little bit better performance, but we've got growth acceleration plans for the back half of the year that we're very, very confident in. Uh, if you look, just based on, you know, apples being apples, we would have actually raised our guidance by about a nickel. But we've made some important acquisitions, the most notable of which is Shockwave, which incurred some financing costs, and then we really fortified the long term uh, for Johnson & Johnson with the acquisition of two bispecifics uh, for atopic dermatitis. Uh, those charges are required to be uh, recognized in the P&L at the moment they're incurred. Uh, in the past, let's go back 18 months, two years ago, we would have special item those out like other uh, companies had done. But uh, following good current corporate um, accounting guidelines, uh, we had to make the change now. So it's, uh, we've assured investors clearly that this is a one-time event. It's not going to linger into 2025 in any significant way. And again, they like to see Johnson & Johnson for the long term. We manage, we're very pleased with the quarter, but we don't manage for quarters, we manage for years. Mm -hmm. And some of these assets that we're bringing into the uh, portfolio really complement our, our presence today in immunology, uh, as well as oncology and neuroscience. Well, sticking with M&A, to that point, Joe, obviously you've been very active in the deal-making space. And I'm wondering, wondering what the continued capacity there is, whether you're looking to do more of these deals to grow. And if so, what areas are particularly in focus? Yeah, so, Katie, we're going to be uh, opportunistic when the time comes, uh, as we always are. We're very fortunate with the strength of our business. Uh, year to date, we've generated almost $8 billion in free cash flow. That goes uh, with a AAA credit rating. So we have the firepower to continue to do what we'd like to do. But while there's two notable deals in the last 18 months of Abiumed and Shockwave that are being integrated and performing to what we expected, if not better than the deal model, we actually did uh, $7 billion of the capital deployment for 70 other deals. Those are the types of deals that may not make headlines when we close them or when we announce them, but we hope that when they have products delivered from them, they will make headlines. And you can think about some of the smaller investments we've made over the last decade or two with Darzalex, Imbruvica, uh, Taurus for bladder cancer. Those will be uh, at least billion dollar platforms, if not five or $10 billion platforms. And those are the, uh, really where the strength of Johnson & Johnson 
Johnson Lies. We are very pleased with the bigger acquisitions we did. We're moving into higher growth markets for med tech, and that's uh, really uh, pro uh, expanding our presence in cardiovascular. I keep hearing um, so much about pharma, uh, Joe, and not as much as I would like to about medical devices. I mean, and you made big acquisitions there, right? So we um, why is that? Uh, why is that unit disappointing the street, and when is it going to outperform? Yep. So if you look, Matt, from where we were back in 2018, we had about a 1.5% growth rate. We've uh, consistently brought that growth rate up about a point a year to last year it was close to 8%. We anticipate, and what we shared with our investors at the Enterprise Business Review in December, was that we expect to play in the upper uh, end of our peer set, 5 to 7% between the years 2022 through 2027. We were personally disappointed with uh, a little bit better than 4% growth in the quarter, but there's two, I'd say, identifiable, addressable items that we feel confident. Uh, one is already remediated, the other one as well as on its way. The first relates to some uh, distributor supply inventories and then bleeding them down. We did see sequential improvement. This is specific to our contact lens business. We did see sequential improvement throughout the quarter. So while some of that bleed down occurred in April, we saw improved performance back to normal levels for that business in May and June. The other issue was uh, China. And to be fair to the team, we had 40% uh, growth in the second quarter of 2023 in China. As you may recall, that country was coming out of many lockdown provisions. Uh, so it was a tough comp to begin with. That being said, the volume didn't come through as we had hoped. There was some price erosion, but the volume didn't come through as we had hoped, as China is, is uh, adopting some new regulation in terms of the interactions between healthcare providers and manufacturers. Everybody's being a little bit cautious at this moment. That's a good thing for business overall. It's how you want to run a healthcare system. Uh, and we actually think that's a strength for J&J &J as some of this um, is figured out. So uh, being in the country for more than 40 years, or about 40 years now, uh, we think we're very well position to capitalize on what will be a better business model. It's how well, you want to conduct healthcare systems. I think, you know, as we saw um, from the vaccine and the pandemic, you're a trusted name. Americans want to reach Thank for you. a Johnson & Johnson product when they can. That said, you're not involved in this weight loss competition. I know in the past you've said um, that the space is just too crowded if it's only weight loss, but that you'd be willing to look if these drugs um, can work really in other areas, like fighting alcoholism, like fighting dementia. What do you think about that now? Can you give us an update? Yeah, so I, I think you're absolutely right, Matt. If you look at where we've been successful in the past, it's where we've had scientific expertise in-house. As far as obesity, we really didn't have that presence to the degree that some of the other companies have. Uh, as it moves into potentially neuroscience or immunology, type of uh, applications, we certainly would have an expertise and that could be something that would entice us. Right now, we don't have anything uh, in our portfolio at this point, but that doesn't mean we don't feel extremely uh, confident in the portfolio we have uh, that awaits us over the next, uh, you know, five, seven years. Joe, also speaking of uh, immunology, I want to talk about Stellara here because yeah. uh, losing the patent exclusivity in the U.S. and Europe uh, broadly across Wall Street, analysts expect this to be an overhang into next year. Can you speak to what kind of overhang you expect as generics come to market? Yeah, so listen, I, um, we're fortunate that we work in an industry that you don't wake up one morning and say, oh my gosh, we've lost exclusivity on a major product. And I'll speak to the breadth of Johnson & Johnson across our pharmaceutical and med tech businesses. We have 25 platforms, soon to be 26, that are greater than a billion dollars in annual revenue. I think back to the time when Remicade uh, it was really the first um, biologic to face biosimilar competition in 2018. People were also, at the same moment in time roughly, fearful of what would happen to the company. Uh, at that time, we had maybe two products that would hit $5 billion in peak year revenue. Today, as I look at our portfolio, as we're about to launch a Stellar loss of exclusivity and the impact in the U.S. in the beginning of next year, we have at least 10 products that will be of $5 billion peak revenue. So we're, we're ready for this. Um, we plan to grow even with the loss of exclusivity in 2025. Not a lot of companies can say that. And it really speaks to the power and strength of J&J's breadth and diversity of portfolio. So it's a challenge, no doubt, but we're uh, certainly up for that challenge and we've been planning for it for years. All right. Well, certainly not an overhang on shares today, at least. Uh, J&J shares currently up over 3%. Joe, really appreciate your time this morning. That is Joe Wolk. He is CFO of Johnson & Johnson.
And Matt Miller, over to you. Let's get to high interest to look at what's making headlines around the world. A Fed rate cut may be warranted in the coming months, though not at the central bank's meeting in two weeks, if the recent inflation slowdown continues. That's what New York Fed President John Williams suggested in a Wall Street Journal in interview. The remarks indicate a September move may be on the table, and we've had a couple of Fed speakers out um, since then. Kathy Wood is making a bold call on Tesla. The ARK Invest CEO says the company's move into the autonomous taxi business will be a catalyst for a roughly tenfold increase in its share price. Wood has been bullish on Tesla for a long time, making it a top holding in her ARK Innovation ETF. The shares of Tesla up 3% this year, um, while the Innovation Fund has lost nearly 9% year to date. And the mayor of Paris has stuck to her word, taking a dip in the Seine to prove that it's safe for swimmers ahead of the Olympics. France earmarked around one and a half billion dollars to clean up the river amid concerns that overflows from the city's sewage system make the river unswimmable. The Olympic triathlon events swimming leg will take place in the Seine, as will the marathon swim. French President Emmanuel Macron has also committed to taking a dip in the river at some point. Shanali? And still ahead, we're going to take a look at the companies making the most buzz on social media today. Social Climbers, that's up next. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for Social Climbers. The company's making waves on media this morning. And first up, Eli Lilly feeling squeezed today after news that the obesity drug market just got a little bit more crowded. Swiss pharma giant Roche is reporting promising results for its experimental weight loss pill. Now, Roche, of course, is one of several companies pushing ahead on oral weight loss drugs in the GLP-1 class. Next up, we have the Google-backed software company GitLab said to be exploring a sale after it attracted acquisition interest from peers, including Datadog. Now, any deal, of course, is still weeks away and no agreement is certain, according to the reports. And finally, Elon Musk says that he will move SpaceX and X headquarters from California to Texas. Now, the billionaire announced the move after California passed a transgender student privacy law. Musk called the new law, quote, the final straw. Now, the move is the latest development in Musk's real shift towards the political right. Recently, of course, Musk endorsed former President Donald Trump in his bid for the White House. And I have to say, guys, I thought that SpaceX and X were already based in Texas, <laughs> at least incorporated there. So there you have it. I, I thought so, too, actually. A lot of this is just a matter of rhetoric here. And we know that Elon Musk has long been critical of a lot of the state's liberal policies. A lot of companies actually moving to Texas, particularly in the tech industry. Um, but you know what? Uh, we will see how many more to come. Texas, uh, even though you have maybe lower taxes, lighter regulation, there's still a lot of concerns about other things like the weather. Yeah. By, and the by weather. the way, this isn't the only company to react to the kind of uh, DEI and woke policies. Um, you saw Deer, for example, you did see Deer. reversing some of its DEI initiatives. They had, I guess, a, a pride event for, for children, and there was a conservative commentator who lashed out against that, and now they've kind of backed off. And don't forget Tractor Supply, another similar story there. And the same conservative commentator, I think, drove Tractor Supply, supply to back off. There you go. But, I mean, even still, you think about Elon Musk's love affair with Texas, if you want to call it that, it feels like this was going to happen eventually but and really, again this was the final straw quickly here I want to point out a story that you pointed out this morning early Tesla backer Ron Barron starting new funds pair of funds to invest in SpaceX itself and XAI that's conviction <laughs> it is and private companies booming all right coming up we'll talk about the turnaround at JC Penney it continues as the company has invested a billion dollars to do it will be the CEO Mark Rosen We have said for many years that stores matter to this consumer, as does digital. I like to put it as stores plus digital equal magic. This consumer does a big part of the business online. The majority of our business is digital, but it doesn't mean that they don't come to the store to transact. That could be to pick up something that they purchased online and popped in to pick up. It could be to do a return or an exchange, see what's new for the day. 
And that was Abercrombie & Fitch CEO Fran Horowitz speaking to us last week. And of course, Abercrombie, it's not the only retailer in renaissance mode. J.C. Penney in the midst of a $1 billion reinvestment plan to enhance the customer experience. Here with us now, I am pleased to say we have Mark Rosen. He is the CEO of J.C. Penney. So you announced that $1 billion reinvestment strategy last August. We're almost a year in. So what has been accomplished? But more importantly, what is left still to do? Yeah, good morning and thank you for having me. So we announced, as you said, about a year ago, a billion dollar self-funded reinvestment in the business as we reinvigorate JCPenney. And um, what you've seen is, first of all, shopping experience. So the shopping experience is obviously incredibly important to us and to our customer. And as far as shopping experience goes, we've invested a lot in remodeling our stores. So by the end of this year, we'll have almost a third of our store fleet will be remodeled and customers will find a new shopping experience when they come into those stores. They're also going to find a new shopping experience online, easier search, easier to find the product they're looking for and more fashion inspiration. So shopping experience is a big part of the investment. Supply chain and technology is another big part of the investment. And we've invested a lot in new technology for our merchants and for our inventory planners to make sure that we have the right things in the right place for the customer. Mm. And then we just rolled out in our Reno distribution center a new sorting system and a new um, um, system that will allow the distribution center to pick orders more efficiently and to make sure that we're more accurately getting those orders to the customer. So supply chain and technology is another key part of it. And a third part is really around the brand. Mm. And in conjunction with that announcement last fall, we rolled out our new, brand, our new brand platform, Make It Count, which is all about making sure that the customer understands that they're gonna find accessible fashion, a rewarding shopping experience at JCPenney, and that we stand by them and their communities. And if we talk about rewarding shopping experience in April, we rolled out a new rewards program for our customers, and we've seen signups increase significantly since we rolled out that program. Right. And we've also seen customers earn more points and coming back to shop and redeeming those points, which is really driving shopping frequency as we go into the back to school season. Well, Mark, there's a lot to dig into there, but I do wanna talk a little bit more about how people are shopping. Of course, shoppers increasingly moving online, but when it comes to your physical footprint, it was interesting. You actually heard in May, Simon Property Group CEO, David Simon say that JCPenney could benefit from opening more physical stores. I know that you recently opened a new location in New Jersey, but when you look to the future and this reinvestment plan, does that include more brick and mortar stores? Right, so we have about 660 stores right now, and stores are a really important part of our shopping experience. If you look at how the customer shops, about a third of our shopping is online or online right now, and about two thirds is in stores. But really that makes it sound much too much, um, too pure. In other words, the customer's starting out online, they're looking and finding the items, they're doing research, and then they're coming into stores. Stores are a really important part of that shopping experience. It's a social experience. Customers want to try product on. And so, as you mentioned, um, this spring we opened a brand new store in Wayne, New Jersey, and we're really excited about that store. It's an all open shopping environment, and it really allows us to showcase the products and the brands and give the um, consumer a great shopping experience. And so that's really important as we move forward through the transformation. I know you took over um, only a couple of years ago, Mark, but I'm sure that President Biden is going to be asking voters, you know, if they're better off now than they were four years ago. What about your customers? How are they faring right now, your consumers? Right. So it's interesting as we think about our customer and our customer really is the core of America. Our customer is America's diverse working families and our customer is the school teacher who's teaching our children. It is the medical worker who is taking care of us and our families. And it's the construction workers who are building the homes and the offices that we live in. And so for our customer, inflation has been very, very difficult. And um, what I say is that our customers are often the first to suffer as inflation hits, and they're the last to recover as that happens. In other words, inflation hits and those mortgage prices, those rent prices go up and those prices stay up, they're sticky, they don't come down right away. And that impacts our customers in a big way. And it's another reason that value is really, really important to our customers. So what we're focused right now as we go into back to school and as the customers shopping for back to school is making sure that we're bringing them incredible value 
so that they can get what they need for the fa their family in these moments. Yeah, if you look at the JCPenney website right now, you do have a lot of deals out there. And I'm wondering right. if, you, if you take a look, to your point, middle to low end consumers across corporate America have shown lots of signs of weakness. How much more do you have to mark items down now to bring in that consumer? Well, I think what's really important to them is is showing them that they can find the fashion that they want. Fashion is really important to our consumer, but they can also find it at a great price. So you're right. If you look at our site right now and if you go into our, uh, our stores, right now we're in Black Friday in July. Back to school is really important. That's top of mind for our customer right now. If they're shopping for a college student moving into the dorm, they're going to find bath towels for $2.99. And if they're shopping for their kids going back to school, they're going to find T-shirts for $4.99. So we have about 7,000 items under $20 for the whole family and over 1,500 items that are under $10, and that's in kids' apparel. So that value is really, really important. I think one of the things that we have at JCPenney is the power of our private label brands, and we have great brands that we design and source and produce, and we can bring them to the customer at a great value and a great savings. You know, I'm also curious about your long game here, Mark. There was a time where JCPenney was under very severe distress, and really you're leading a turnaround story here. What does JCPenney look like three, five years from now? Financially. Right, we're really focused. I'm sorry, I missed the last part. Oh, financially. Uh, financially, okay. Um, so we're really focused on the customer and that customer experience and bringing the customer a great shopping experience. And we know at the end of the day, that's what's going to drive great financial results. If you look at the business right now, we have one of the cleanest balance sheets in the entire industry, and that's very important. So we have under um, half a billion dollars of debt on the balance sheet right now. So a very clean balance sheet, over $1.6 billion of liquidity, and the business is generating strong cash flow. And it's that cash flow when you go back to the investment and the over a billion dollar investment back in the business, that cash flow is what we're using to invest back into the business. Mm -hmm. When I look to the future, what I see is this is going to be a business that has a mix of stores, has a mix of online, and is generating a healthy cash flow because we're delivering what the customer needs, which right now is great product, accessible fashion at a great value, and a really rewarding shopping experience. Well, Mark, just to follow up on that point, again, you look far in the future, five years down the line, and I hear what you say on there being a lot of milestones to hit, but could we see JCPenney go public again? So right now, um, as you mentioned, we're private right now, and that does give us the advantage of being able to invest in this transformation, and that's really important right now is to be able to take that cash invested in the transformation to really focus on the customer. And right now we're, we're in what I would say is the middle of that transformation. We've invested a lot in the shopping experience. I said about a third of our stores will be remodeled by the end of this year, but there's still a lot more to do in terms of stores and the online experience and the shopping experience. And we're in the process of reinvigorating our brand. So that's what's important to us now. We're continuing to drive that cash flow, continuing to reinvest in the experience for the customer, and we'll see what the future brings. I wonder about keeping your employees engaged. You know, I spend, for, for whatever reason, a lot of time in big box stores um, uh, uh, here in Westchester, and oftentimes employees are on break, don't really care, you know, messing around with products instead of customers. How do you keep them engaged, and how much more have you had to pay them over the last, say, you know, three years? Right. So for our customers, I think I, I joined the company about two and a half years ago. And when I did, we really united around our purpose, which is to serve and celebrate with America's diverse working families. And the interesting, I think the really great thing for us is our employees are also America's diverse working families and they see what we're doing for their communities and what we're doing for them. And they are engaged in the purpose of the company, in the culture of the company and in bringing back and driving those results that I talked about. So that's what's really important in terms of keeping um, our, our associates engaged. We've actually, over the last couple of years, seen a big increase in our net promoter score, which is how we, manage how we measure customer satisfaction when customers are in our stores. 
And so we're really pleased with the way that our customers are staying close to the customer, engaged with the customer, and making sure they have a great experience in store. And part of the investment is also in technology, like new point of sale technology and mobile point of sale to make sure that that customer does have a better experience every time they come into the store. Mark, you place clearly a lot of importance on inclusion and diversity. You celebrate diversity events. Is that harder in today's climate? We just saw deer, you know, have to back down. Um, we were talking about tractor supply. You're in Dallas, Texas. Is it harder for you? What I would say is, again, our customer is is America's diverse working families, and our customer is, is a broad set that really reflects America. That is the same of our employee base, and we are really focused on respect and and inclusion for all of um, our customer base and our employee base, and, and it is important to everything that we do. Mark, we thank you so much for joining us today. Best of luck to you. That is the CEO of J.C. Penny in the middle of a big turnaround. Now let's get a check on the markets with Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Abby. We still have stocks under pressure. Chanel, if we take a look at the NASDAQ 100 futures, we can see that uh, early on uh, around last time, last night, uh, Eastern time, basically flat and then drifting lower, lower, lower. And at the lows not so long ago, down more than 2.4%. Uh, that would have been putting us on pace at that point for the worst day of the year. Right now, we're on pace for the worst day uh, since last week. But it's very interesting, out of the last 17 trading days, the NASDAQ 100 up 13 of those days. Three of the declines, though, greater than 1%. So we have some volatility on the down days. The Russell 2000, which has been in this big rotation to the upside as money was coming out of big tech and some of the big cap names, not holding on to that today. But it's not entirely a risk-off picture because we do have uh, yields trading higher. This 10-year yield up three basis points, a two-year yield up five basis points. And then gold, it's you know putting all these pieces together, uh, hitting an all-time high today. There is a little bit of a haven bid there, where I would argue that there's really a haven bid, and this goes beyond the big tech trade being driven by the Biden administration talking about a greater crackdown on China chips. Take a look at the yen, the dollar yen down 1.2 percent. That means the haven yen is strengthening. It also means that the carry trade is unwinding. That puts pressure on risk assets. We saw that two weeks ago, and if we take a look at the chart of the yen that we looked at then, we're going to see that we are still seeing some damage. So this is basically the yen in relation to its 50-day moving average and its 200-day moving average. Last time we looked at this chart, it was right on on the 50 day moving average on today's move lower for the dollar yen below it. I would say based on past trading history, Katie, it does look like we could see this dollar yen uh, weaken right down to uh, that 200 day moving average around 151. If that's the case, the question is, will that be another source of pressure on stocks? All right, Abigail Doolittle, thank you so much. Now coming up, the Basel III waiting game. Former Fed Governor Dan Tarullo tells us why the presidential election could delay the final rule. This is Bloomberg. Now for our Daily Wall Street Week conversation and the long wait for the final Basel III regulations might go on for a little longer. Former Fed Governor Dan Tarullo told Wall Street Week host David Weston what could change and when. There's a fair amount of leeway, David, um, particularly in the proposals that the three agencies made last year on the credit side. Uh, they went well beyond what Basel III had agreed to. Um, there's a little bit less room in the other areas that is operational risk and market risk. Uh, and actually, I would, I would not be surprised if on operational risk, the agencies depart some from the Basel Agreement. Because to be perfectly honest, the Basel Agreement on operational risk was not especially well done. Hmm. So what do you expect, speculating now, what we'll see when the next round of proposals come out? Will they be cutting back in the reserve requirements? Oh, sure. Um, no question about it. I think Chair Powell has made uh, no secret of the fact that there'll be substantial changes, which net-net means a significant reduction in the required increase in capital. But I do expect that the amount of increase will vary quite a bit depending on the business model of the bank. I think you can expect to see the banks with uh, most market risk, that is trading activity, capital markets and the like, 
I think you can expect that their requirements will go up more than banks that are strict, uh, straight traditional lenders, where most of it's the, you know, traditional loans and deposit taken. Um, on the operational risk side, I, I still fear that we're going to have a little bit of a perverse outcome where some of the banks that have de-risked get hit a little bit by the operational risk charges on things like wealth management. Uh, so I guess I would say if you're a bank with a lot of trading and a fair degree of non-credit uh, operational risk, you're probably going to see your capital requirements go up um, more than anybody else's. If you're a traditional regional bank, I suspect the increase will be very, very modest. Dan, we've seen some back and forth between the first Trump administration and then the Biden administration, and what looks may, it may well be, let's be honest, a possible second Trump administration. If Donald Trump is in fact elected, how might that change the calculus? Well, in the first place, David, given the intent to repropose, it's very unlikely that a final rule could be done uh, before the end of the year, much less before Election Day. And so if past pattern, patterns hold, uh, there will be a kind of hold on regulation, uh, and it would await the Trump appointees, uh, certainly to the FDIC and the OCC, uh, to make their own decisions. So that probably means that, uh, at the very least, there'd be a further delay, and you could quite possibly have additional changes. This week, we learned uh, who the nominee for vice president on the Republican side would be as well, J.D. Vance, the senator from Ohio. And normally, I would say, well, it's a vice president. Let's not worry about it. But he, as I understand it from you, has had some things to say about banks. Oh, sure. He's on the Senate Banking Committee. And his, you know, you can't, you, you wouldn't, you would make a mistake if you tried to just slot him as you know, bank or industry friendly or, or antagonistic. I, I think he has his own set of views. Um, he's said some things and uh, signed on to some bills that are kind of pro-regulatory. He, he evinced some skepticism about the growth of very large banks. Um, on the other hand, obviously, in a lot of areas, he thinks there's been too much regulation. But I would say on banking, there's at least a chance that that's one of the areas, because of his service on the banking committee, in which he takes a real interest if, they, if the Trump advance ticket should be elected. And that might mean that uh, the positions of those appointees I referred to a moment ago are not quite as predictable as we might have thought a week or so ago. Dan, typically when I think about regulation, I think about Congress, I think about the executive branch, some independent agencies. But increasingly, I'm thinking about the Supreme Court, particularly given some of the decisions we saw just this term that tends to move in the direction, I think it's fair to say, against a lot of regulation. How might those decisions possibly affect what we're seeing coming up in the bank regulatory area? Well, that's a really good question, David. Um, and I think here we have to distinguish among the four decisions, the of decisions that I think are broadly recognized to have been a part of the campaign against the uh, administrative state. Um, the most talk has been about the Loper Bright decision, which overturned Chevron. That's the one that says that when a statute's ambiguous, the uh, court should defer to an agency interpretation of the statute. Um, understandably, that's where a lot of attention has been focused. I actually think that in the bank regulatory area, it may be somewhat less consequential than, for example, in securities regulation or environmental regulation. And that was former Fed Governor Dan Tarullo with Wall Street Week host David Weston talking, of course, about bank regulation, Basel III endgame, and J.D. Vance. I think it might be well. Basel, actually. Yeah, according to some bloggers, from, yeah. yeah. You know, I did a thing where I pulled up a conversation I had with J.D. Vance back in December because I didn't ask just about bank regulation. I asked about whether he would further regulate private funds. Remember, J.D. Vance came from the private fund universe. He said you don't want to artificially drive funds into private equity. I think in this uh, next administration, whether it's Biden or Trump, you have to look at not just bank regulation, but will they go harder on the non-banks that have gotten so big? Yeah, and of course, uh, it remains to be seen how much influence J.D. Vance will actually has have as the vice president. Now, tomorrow on Wall Street Week, we're going to hear from former National Economic Council director Laura, Laura Tyson, rather. This is Bloomberg.
Shall we get to the trading diary? Let's do it. Let's do that. What you need to be watching this week, Bloomberg continues special coverage on the ground in Milwaukee for the Republican National Convention. There is a 20-year bond auction taking place at 1 p.m. Eastern. Don't forget to watch for that. <laughs> also this afternoon, we get the Fed's beige book. And then tomorrow, the ECB, the European Central Bank decision, will bring you that in its entirety. What do you think Christine Lagarde's gonna do? Wear a I scarf. can't get it. Yeah, she'll yeah. definitely wear a scarf. A summer hope. scarf. I mean, they already cut, but then they said, like, we're not going to keep cutting, at least not for now. The next cut will come later. The IMF warning this week alone, and you wonder if she'll address some of those concerns too. Can we talk about U.S. markets? I'm freaking out. The S&P 500, it's down 1.1% on elevated volume as well, guys. Uh, take a look at the Bloomberg. Currently 35% above the 20-day average for trading volume, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, those indexes that don't have NVIDIA on them are doing much better. Yeah, so For example, the, the Russell, you yeah. see there? It's the worst drop you're seeing in the S&P 500 since the end of April. So this is a pretty significant drop off, and you're right, it's across a, a multiple indices. Yeah, it is interesting to see a little uh, pause on the rotation trade. We'll have to check back in tomorrow, because coming up tomorrow on Open Interest, Andrew Slimmon of Morgan Stanley Investment Management, Jennifer Rumsey of Cummins. Cummins. And yes, I'm excited for that conversation. Also, Steve Tannenbaum of Golden Tree Asset Management. All of that coming up tomorrow, but that does it for us for now. This is Bloomberg.